Yeah, All right, All right. Cool. Whenever you're ready, everybody. All right. Welcome back to another fun-filled episode of the Mullet Cast, the podcast where business and pleasure collide. Uh, my name is Evan Balmer. Um, I am drinking water. My name is Mike Marcia. And today we are joined by Brian Hentz. Brian is with Ace Office Solutions. They are a local vendor of Konica, Minolta, Kyocera, multi multi-functioning office copiers, as well as KIP wide format printers. Um, check them out online at aceofs.com. Um, we also got we got you tagged on Facebook. Um, I am going to break with tradition. Um, first of all, what's up, Brian? How you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> Excellent. Nice to be here. Um, today we we're going to pull the first ever reverse mullet. Oh. Um, we I always like we always start out <laughs> with the business in the front and pleasure in the back. But you just dropped a bomb on us when you walked in the studio today, uh, something I never knew. And it's funny because we asked people that were like, you know, send over your bio, tell us a little bit about you, drop, uh, you know, the, Fun facts. the yeah. social media handles you want to share. And then you casually mentioned that you are not, I mean, you told us you're an avid Mets fan, but you're more than an avid Mets fan. You are Orange Man. Yeah, yeah, I am actually. I've been on the news a couple of times. I was on the Mets Facebook page and everything, and uh, yeah, that's what I do in my spare time. Uh, <laughs> dress up as Orange Man and go to Mets games. That's awesome. So check out on Instagram <laughs> at nym underscore Orange Man. Um, how did you become a Mets fan? Oh boy, that goes back a really long time. Uh, my grandfather, actually, I grew up. Uh, that my grandmother and grandfather lived with me until I was about ten years old. And I just remember sitting on his knee watching the Mets games with him until he passed when I was at a very young age. But my grandfather was very close to me. And uh, really just that's been my way of still connecting with him after death. Right. And it's, you know, it's been a rough road, that's for sure. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's still been a fun ride. And I, I love my team. So that is, that's you? That would be me. That's what? awesome, man. That's hilarious. Now, yeah. did your grandfather throw on orange shoots as well? You know, he did not. <laughs> right. he, he was a snazzy dresser, but right. I don't know if he would have had the courage to do what I do. That's cool. So what made you, uh, how do you do that for the first time? Yeah, uh, you know, I was at the Halloween store. That's really what it was, like right around October, and I was going to look for something else, and I saw this suit sitting there, and I was like, oh, that would be perfect for Mets games. Right. And I wore it to the first Mets game, and I realized, I can't see a goddamn thing. <laughs> you can see like five feet in front of you, even right. on like a day game. Yeah. So I'm like, how am I going to do this? Right. Like, I can't cut a hole. You know what that would look like for right. my mouth. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, all right, so e eating and drinking is out. Yeah. And I figured I got to see, so I poked eye holes in it and wore the shade over it so it doesn't look that weird that but, actually uh, looks legit yeah. so i can actually see perfectly now, fine through the shades the hair is separate yeah it's an additional hat there you go that's sweet now is that hair sewn into the mets headband or are those two, uh, yeah two it's like items? a winter cap so it's sort of like <laughs> our, Dude, a hilarious. mullet piece we have too yeah exactly that's killer man yeah it's really a hit of the games i'm telling you i take like at least 50 to 100 pictures of people as i walk <laughs> around like everyone treats me like a mascot it's a lot of fun has right. anyone uh try to copy you yeah, yeah, actually, some guy actually took my picture and put it as his profile picture and tried to say it was him, and I was like, thanks. <laughs> wow. It's a little weird. It's a copyright right there. Well, I mean, you've never seen the two of you together, so yeah, it's exactly. possible. Yeah, exactly. You never know. All right. So what year did you break out Orange Man? I want to say it's been about seven years, give or take. I've <laughs> been going so opening funny. day 11 years in a row. Uh, I, I really wouldn't miss a game if they go to the playoffs, which I haven't. I, it's It's... You know, it's dedication to a pretty crappy team. <laughs> That's cool, man. It looks like you got some uh, Mets Jello shots there. Do you pack those or? Oh those yeah, I mean, you, you, you can see we got a crew of like thirty people. We right. started eleven years ago with me and three friends, and it's turned into a party <laughs> bus of thirty people every That's year. Awesome. Just Is it really? Every year we get more and more people. Where we even have too much for the bus, people meet us there. Right. We have a big group. We get like forty tickets. That's cool. You I started think, that? Uh, me and three of my buddies. Yeah. That's all. Now, have you thought of getting your own Orange Man mobile? You know, maybe in the future <laughs> when I have those extra funds to get my own Mets bus and yeah. <laughs> where I can store can it somewhere. Dream, right? Yeah, maybe. That's maybe. cool, man. Um, so, sorry, what year did you bust this out, did you say? About seven years ago, Seven I'd years say. ago. And then how many games would you say you hit a year? Oof. Well, it depends on how good they are. Right. Yeah. Like this year, there was no <laughs> reason to go watch them. I think I only went to like three games, but I try to get out to at least 10 a year. Yeah, that's cool. You ever yeah. get down to spring training? Uh, I do. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually, my parents have a house down in Florida about two and a half hours away from uh, Port St. Lucie. So oh, nice. every now and then we'll go down, take a drive, see a game. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. You got any, who are your favorite Mets? You know, I got a, an odd one that not too many people say, but Edgardo Alfonso was my guy, you oh, know, yeah. all through the 90s and the early 2000s. Like, that guy was a clutch hitter. Right. Uh, he was really a lot of fun to watch. He was always one of my favorites. He was definitely like the rock of the Mets. That's like, for sure. That and no one has batted 300 since. Right. <laughs> 
So, uh, I mean, I have similar baseball memories as you. It's funny. I had one grandfather that was a Mets fan and one that was a Yankees fan. And, like, I remember, like, yesterday watching games with them, and they, that's what they did. Like, every night there was a game. It was crazy. Oh, yeah. Um, and then for, like, by, I guess... I'm lucky, but I was just equally as cursed as when I was a kid, I was a Nolan Ryan fan. Um, and I remember going out and buying like for 10 bucks at the time when I was probably 10 years old, like a Nolan Ryan rookie card when he's on the Mets, you know? So fortunately, when I, by the time I knew him, he was an Astro. So I became an Astros fan. Um, well, there you go. He you know. saved you. But I, he <laughs> saved me from like your misery. But yeah. I mean, I had my own misery for a long time. Like, you know, I mean, we, we, we're a successful team, but I never thought I'd see a World Series championship, and then we finally did. So. I still don't know if I will. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You're a younger generation of... Uh, it's up in the of, air, man. Uh, yep. Last day of 89, I was born. Were you really? Yeah. Wow. That's crazy, man. All right, so we'll keep it on the uh, the backside of your mullet for a while. You've got some other some other crazy hobbies. You, you sing in a band. I do. Oh, do you really? Yeah. I didn't know that either. Yeah, so this guy's like, he's got all the secrets. Yeah. Right? He's, he's orange man. He's a singer. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah I, thought, I thought bowling was going to be the hot topic, but let's... You've got to have some mystery to me, man. Yeah. yeah. Right. they got to turn the pages, have something to figure out. All so, right. So tell us about your band. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, believe it or not, I, I went to Monmouth University. So, I mean, I'm local right here in Monmouth County. You know, that's, I know it like the back of my hand. And I was hanging out at the local bar, uh, Jack's Goal Line Stand. Yep. And they Best do karaoke. Yeah. So, that was like the Monmouth hangout where all the students went. So, over my course of going to school there, I went there all the time. And they do karaoke. So, I yeah. like to do karaoke. And I was sitting down at the bar. And there was this guy next to me just like casually having small talk, talking about sports, whatever was on TV. And I went up to sing. When I came back, he was like, wow, man, that was really good. And I'm like, oh, yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. And he's like, no, seriously, like, you're really good. I'm like, well, thank you. I, I really do appreciate the comments. And he was like, well, I actually play in a band, a band. I play by myself, and I play acoustic guitar in local bars. And I right. sing, but I'm not that good. So he's like, if you want, like, maybe come join me on Thursday. You know, I just do some cover songs. You can bring up an iPad, sing the lyrics or whatever. Right. You know, we get a small crowd, and that was like... Two years ago, mm -hmm. and now like we're really good friends. We practice all the time. We haven't had much time for uh, too many gigs lately because he's actually in the um, he's in the Coast Guard. Okay. So okay. he got called out for like two months. So uh, that really put a damper on our rehearsal schedule. But uh, you know, we've been doing some local bars. We've been doing like graduation parties, little small get-togethers, backyard parties, those sorts of things. Nice, but nice. you know, for something that we threw together two years ago, it's been a lot of fun. That's cool. What kind of music do you guys play? Uh, we do a lot of like uh, today's hits, like rock. Um, nothing really back past the '90s. Right. Uh, we try to keep it like to today's generation. So mm. when we go to local bars with young people, that they'll appreciate it. Uh, we don't typically play to like an older crowd, even though I consider myself an older soul. Right. I mean, my grandfather was my best friend. I could sit here and bust out Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra and all those sorts of things. That's yeah. really my go-to. That's cool. But, you know, just to try to appease the crowd, we go for more, like, relevant music. D does the band have a uh, social media page? No, uh, yeah. we, we really haven't gotten anything kicked off because it was something that we just threw together and we kind of just do at our leisure for fun. Even most gigs, we haven't even really charged. We've oh, had really? some friends say, like, i got a graduation party if you guys want to get a free rehearsal out of it. And we're like, sure, we just love to play. That's and nice. And people appreciate it and they think we sound good. Yeah. Give us some free beer to come out. Right. I'm cool with it. That's awesome. And then when you do play out, what kind of places have you played? Um, I'm trying to think. We did uh, that place down the street from Jack's uh, in Long Branch that's changed like three times on the corner. Um, uh, right, right next to the bagel place? I think so. Yeah. Right on the corner of uh, Brighton, I think it yeah. is over there. Brighton Bar, uh, I think Richie played by himself one of these days that I wasn't around. But cool. yeah, any of these local pubs. Um, Celtic we played a couple of months ago. Right. Nice. Yeah. That's sweet. Well, where are you, where are you venues, from so. originally? What's your Sarahville. Name? Sarahville. Born and, and raised. Now you live down here? I live in New Brunswick. Okay. Nice. Yeah. That's cool. All right, let's talk some bowling, man. Yeah. All right, what do you want to talk about bowling? Lay it on me. Uh, well, uh, my father was a professional bowler. He was actually he really? was on the PBA tour. He bowled against wow. the best on ESPN, on television, Dude, and everything. I mean, yeah, 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 I didn't know that. I didn't know any of this. <laughs> you keep this info so tight to the vest. Like, I don't. I you mean, just got to ask, man. Yeah, my my friends will right. tell it's you people easy. pay me to shut up, so you just clearly <laughs> haven't been asking the right questions. That's crazy. All right, so what's your dad's name? My dad's name, believe it or not, is Crane. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the bird or the heavy machinery or the toilet brand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dad has a very unique name, and it was actually my grandfather's name, too. So I'm oh, wow. truly blessed that he didn't go with Crane III. <laughs> <That's third. true. laughs> but um, yeah. it was a blessing and a curse because I go anywhere and no one ever forgets my father's name. And okay. I, I mean... One of the coolest things was I was working at the bowling alley when I was 18, mm-hmm. and uh, the pro tour came through, and I got a break, and I ran around with like a shirt that I wanted to get signed from all the pros that I had been watching on TV, and I went up to Parker Bone, who's been one of the best bowlers for the last 25 years, and I went up to him, and I said, excuse me, I was really hoping to get your autograph. My name is Brian Hens, and he goes, wait a minute, Hens? He goes, your father is Crane. I was like, really? You remember him? And he was like, remember him? Your father is probably the nicest guy I've ever met on the Pro Tour. I wish him nothing but the best. Please tell him I said hello. And I was like, he wasn't bullshit. (laughs) (laughs) All all, all these times growing up telling me he knew these guys, he wasn't kidding. And uh, it was really cool to get that kind of recognition and like reassurance that, you know, my dad has been showing me the right way to do things in the bowling alley. Mm Because it can be a toxic environment if you let it get to you because there's a lot of shady stuff going on in the bowling alley but right. it's a matter of just you know same way i like to conduct my business just being square and honest with people yeah. sportsmanship yeah excuse right. me but um i've been bowling since i was three years old wow. I mean, my dad really got me going as soon as i could walk and uh no sooner i like turned 18 and was like able to bowl adult with him we've been doing doubles leagues uh, oh, that's like, cool got 10 300s my dad has 17 of them still oh, trying goodness. to catch him wow. that's crazy but uh yeah I, I bowl a lot there's times like in the winter when uh, i got some things going that might even be five six days a week sometimes yeah. no, did monmouth have a bowling team you know that was the most aggravating thing about monmouth university to me because i went there i found out that they had a club okay i got a scholarship to go to William Patterson, which is one of the best bowling schools in the country. Their okay. A team is like number two or three, and their B team is top 10, and their C team is like top 15. Okay. Meanwhile, we had a club, but I was more worried about education than I was a bowling team, mm. so I went to Monmouth, and we started up the club. We were terrible. We drove all over the place to upstate New York, to Delaware, to Maryland, and we'd go to these tournaments and come in dead last. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was so frustrating. <laughs> and then when I leave Monmouth, they build the Mac, and they install a bowling alley in no the basement. Way. I was like, who who can I call? Yeah, <laughs> who can yeah. I just show up and yeah. wring someone's neck for a few seconds? Because I was so aggravated that, that I could sucks. have been practicing for did, free all those years. Did you years. get any credit to, to that happening? Or no, no, because, no, I mean, our, our team was so bad. There wasn't yeah. even, like, you know, any sort of records that we set or there was no milestone of, like, hey, you did the best in that individual tournament. We were just in a different league. Okay. And it, we really didn't even compete, but it was still fun. It yeah. was something to do, you know, and really get out there and compete with some really good bowlers throughout the country. Nice. Now, That's really cool. Yeah, what, what does your dad do now? Uh, my dad's been retired for 26 years, 25 okay. years. He's had a lot of heart issues. So he, okay. re- he retired from public service a long time ago, and then he had to stop his bowling career too because you can't exactly take off of work on disability then see him on TV bowling on right. ESPN. Yeah. So he had to kind of, that took a back seat, but he's been, you know, stay at home, dad, mom, whatever you want to call it, Mr. Mom all right. these years, and it's... <laughs> been really rewarding being okay. able to have him at home and share all these things with him and be able to go bowling go golfing and yeah he's been at every sporting event every bowling match every time i was on stage for a show or something like he's always been there so it's been really nice that's cool I'll just, I'll, sorry i'll just read yeah. something you said about your dad because you shared something with us pretty cool so while you're talking about it, it said uh that you do take after your dad he's your teacher your mentor your critic and best friend uh that he taught you to do a job big or small and do it right or not at all um and that's how you deal squarely and honestly and yeah. keep your word, basically. Absolutely. I, I mean, it, it's kind of like a life motto. It's something that, like, I can just hear, like, a record player just going on in my head anytime, even when my dad's not around. If I'm doing a job and I leave it half ass, I'll stop, I'll hear it, and I'll turn around and be like, just do the job right. Yeah. Like, you're, you're doing it, get it done. I, it's really been motivation throughout my whole life with anything that I've taken on. And I, you know, it's a catchy little slogan. I've used it in a lot of job interviews and it goes a long way, but it's something that I, I truly believe. Mm-hmm. I love that. Now you said, uh, your dad's been to sporting events. You said on stage. Yeah. I acted for about 12 years. Let's get into that. Well, <laughs> we got a lot of mullet conversation. Uh, no, I love but, it. Yeah, this kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the singing. I mean, I've just I've done musical theater going back to when I was like seven years old. Did it all the way up to college. Uh, 
did a lot of like public theater. I okay. mean, I was Kanicki in Greece, Charlie Brown and Charlie Brown, Oliver and Oliver. The list goes on. I probably did like I don't know, maybe fifteen shows or something like that throughout my acting career. But um, it was a lot of fun. It was something that maybe I wish I would have pursued a little bit more because yeah. I enjoy it so much. But I was thinking practically. And I was saying to myself, do I chase a dream and maybe end up in my parents' basement at 35 for going out to California and coming back broke or something like that? Yeah. Or take advantage of an opportunity. And I had my parents to support me all through college, get a good degree, ended up getting my master's degree in criminal justice. Wow. I'm in sales now, so riddle right. me that. But in, <laughs> in the same sense, I was a little worried to really jump uh, out on a ledge like that. Yeah. Now here we are, where I'm approaching 30, and my father says to me the other day, like sitting there having a beer, and he sighs and goes, you know, I really wish you would have pursued acting. Ah, <laughs> oh, there you go. You, you yeah. could have been so good. You were so much better than a lot of the people you were on stage with. I really would have liked to see that. I'm like, information that would have been good to me yesterday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is it too late? Yeah, uh, you man. know, it's never it's too never late, too man. Late. It's never too late. But, you know, I, I got a good gig going right now that I really like, and I'm able to put enough money away where who knows? You know, yeah. down the road when I when I got you know, another door opens, you know, we'll, we'll see if that's something I want to pursue later in life. I mean, Steve Carell didn't even become famous until he was 40. Yeah. So, I mean, right. there's... The office, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, there, there's plenty of outlets and, you know... Rodney. It's all about who yeah. you know, and that's the great thing about being in sales is that I network all the time, yeah. and I get to meet a lot of great people that are able to show me different opportunities, like the one I'm sitting in right yeah, now. I mean, like, heck, if I didn't network and meet you guys at La Tip, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. So sure. it, it's uh, it's been fun. And actually, your Corel is like a good segue to uh, the front of your mullet, which is your business <laughs> side, because you yeah. work for... Ace Office Solutions, which maybe is a little bit like... Uh, Thunder Mifflin? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny. It is. And a lot of my friends made that joke. They've been calling me the Jim Halpert like, type of thing. <laughs> because, I, you know, we, we don't sell paper, but we sell the paper accessories yeah, that go inside the product that right. we're selling. So it is all like that sort of jargon. What was... Uh, Sa Sabre was the paper company. Yes, the exactly. Office. Yep. <laughs> I'm a diehard, so... Yep, and they sold the printers that lit on fire. Yes. Uh, yep. Yep. Nice. <laughs> ours not, don't. Not you guys don't. Ours right? don't. <laughs> <laughs> Just need so, to clarify that. So what got you into uh, to that? Well, you know, uh, right out of college, I mentioned I had my degree in criminal justice, and um, a fraternity brother of mine had said, like, hey, I know you're graduating this uh, this winter. If you're looking for a job, just, you know, something to bring in consistent paycheck for a while. Uh, his boss was hiring for a home care agency here in uh, Monmouth County, right mm -hmm. uh, in Eatontown. Okay. And I said, yeah, well, I mean, what the heck? I'm good with people. I'm good on the phones. I'm good with grandparents. Mine's li lived with me for my whole life. So I was like, this seems like a pretty easy gig to get into. And I was doing that for, like, maybe three months before before I met the CEO of the company at a Christmas party. And he had a brief conversation with me, and naturally he was uh, interested in the acting and the singing, and I was on mm -hmm. American Idol. He wanted to hear the story. Oh, were me. you really? Yeah, I was on American Idol, <laughs> made television, met Simon and all them. So he really wanted to hear that story. So after I told him that, he went up to my boss. He's like, where's your boss? Where is he? And he pulled him over, and it's this guy, Michael Bailey, that I wanted to come on your show too. But right. So he says to Mike, what is he doing? And he said, uh, I got him answering phones, like staffing cases. And he said, if you don't get him out on the road selling, you're fired. Get yeah. this kid like, in an orange yeah, suit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Seriously. He, he just knew, like he recognized that I had a knack with people. So right away I started going out and selling. And the, I really do credit that job a lot for my success in sales. Because from what I've been told from like a lot of people that are looking for salespeople, they like criminal justice mindset students because we have a desire to help people. Mm -hmm. So we're not going in there with the idea to swindle somebody or how can we squeeze the most juice or money out of them. I'm really, I try to approach it and say like, rather than go in and try to sell somebody something, try to help them solve a problem or achieve a goal. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm going to make my commission on whatever I sell, but it's a matter of not beating somebody over the head. We got to give them a product that they need and then be able to show them that we're going to service it throughout the entirety of the lease agreement that we promised them. And yeah. really, like I keep trying to reiterate, just dealing squarely and honest with people because it comes back tenfold. Yeah. When they realize down the road that I did right by them, they're going to give me more business, more lucrative business because yeah. they trust me. So it's I really do try to build that trust aspect going in and because 
in all honesty, there's not many variations between printers and copiers. They right. all do what you need them to do. They print, copy, scan, fax. They got hole punch. They got stapling finishers. I mean, you can figure out all of these things that a printer has, especially working in a law office. Right. You use these. You know what these machines do. And everyone's going to come in. They're going to try to undercut you and give you a better price or something like that. But it all comes down to the service. Right. And our service really is second to none. I mean, I haven't been with the company a very long time. But I inherited a lot of customers, and I called them all up to introduce myself, and they had nothing but amazing things to say about the service. And that really reassured me to kind of stick with this job and with this company because, really, I've, I've heard no bad things, and right. they, they sell mm -hmm. a quality product. So what kind of uh, target customers do you have? Like, who are you providing machines for? Well, I mean, you can imagine. It, it's a pretty easy gig in the sense that everyone needs a copier. Mm -hmm. If you work in an office, if you have any sort of paper volume, even if you work in a home office and you don't want to be sitting there for an hour to print out a 50-page document, it might be time for an upgrade. Right. And I see a lot of people that don't necessarily, and hey, I didn't even realize it before I took this job, and I've worked in plenty of offices, but a lot of people think they're doing themselves a favor, getting these little desktop units from Staples. You pay a couple hundred bucks, and they get the job done. Right. You look at that and say that was a cheap expense. You go to your budget and you say I only spent a few hundred bucks. Right. But then you don't realize every month you're buying the toner that costs eighty bucks a pop. Right. So if you just would have went with a bigger machine with a lease agreement that was only a couple more bucks a month, mm -hmm. you don't even have to worry about the toner and it shows up at your doorstep when it's out. Right. So it's a much simpler process that I think more business owners need to really take it into consideration that this is actually an opportunity to save some money. Right. Mm -hmm. I even had a guy the other day saying, like, listen, I, I was thinking about it, and we just have way too many monthly costs around here, and I'm trying to reduce that, so I don't know if I want to do a lease agreement. We reviewed his situation and saw the machine that he was using was wasteful. It was mm -hmm. old. It was just hemorrhaging money. And I got him a brand-new machine, twice the size, twice the speed for half the price. So people just don't even realize what right. options are out there for them. It's fine because printers really are. They're like uh, they got to be a loss leader for all these companies. Is they're really just toner sales. You know, it's a vessel to sell you toner basically. Yeah, it's yeah. true. It is wild. So it's funny. It's like I did the when I first opened my office, um, bought one of those Staples machines, right? And I'm doing like one of my first closings, and I got this like thick loan packet that has to be scanned and faxed out, right? So I excuse myself from the closing table go up to scan this like 200 page monstrosity of, you know and when you buy the thing you're like oh it sounds like it scans pretty fast right and then you realize like nee, you know one page at a time you know I'm, go I'm literally gone for like a half hour everyone's like where the hell did that guy go man yeah you know? and meanwhile like, no one else can use it while you're using right, it either right, so it clogs so, up the whole thing yeah it's true um, so it is pretty funny um, so Ace check out at aceofs.com um, and what kind of other than copiers, what kind of stuff? What's the large format stuff? So, yeah, we got these KIPP wide format machines, and we've got some great end-of-the-year promotional offers going on right now. So these machines are really for your high-end print jobs, guys that are doing big uh, blueprints mm -hmm. or um, drawings for... Uh, uh, if they're trying to, um, like architects, builders, right. uh, contractors, anything like that, that are really doing these extravagant plans for customers and even for their own staff, uh, they really have some amazing high resolution prints. And uh, they're very expensive machines. I mean, these are not something that I'm telling someone that has a startup wants to just go ahead and get themselves a KIPP-wide format. Mm. I mean, these machines are starting at about $20,000. Right. So wow. these are a huge commitment for businesses, but they realize in the long run, especially when they're doing an abundance of these prints, mm -hmm. they're really doing themselves a disservice by going to Staples or going online and purchasing a used unit for a couple grand. It may seem like a good idea and it may seem like you're saving money now and it's something that's just like a band-aid that you'll get, you'll, it'll cover what you need it for for the time being, but ultimately it, it, you're really losing a lot of money in the long run. Right. And mm -hmm. Even though these machines are a big cost up front, uh, we can show you how it makes sense for your business that it'll eventually uh, turn over and make you uh, get you back into the green. That's cool. Are you regional, or could you sell wherever? Cover the whole state. Okay. Uh, we have a, we have a couple other great sales reps that we all have our territories divvied up, but in the same sense, we play nice in the sandbox where it's no big deal, where if I meet somebody that has an office somewhere in someone else's territory, we're not going to try to yeah. know, cut that out. Okay. 
So what's your territory? I cover Monmouth and Union. Okay, cool. Yeah, and it's easy because I live in Middlesex, so it's pretty much one or the other. I'm right, right there, but I'm always out in my territory. I'm always visiting my customers, just trying to make sure that even after the sale that I'm remaining in contact and being available to these people and letting them know that I'm not just here to sell you something and then never talk to you again. Mm-hmm. I try to reassure all of my customers by giving them my personal sell and saying if anything ever goes wrong, God forbid, because these things happen. The, right. These yeah. things jam. I, it'd be foolish of me to go in there and try to tell some of these things didn't happen but even a minor issue i want them to be able to contact me and know that they bought me that people yeah. buy people and if they went with our company it's because they liked me yeah and i'm going to be a man of my word and show them that i'm still going to be for, there for them after the sale do you um have a niche market you know is it like schools or you know attorney offices or is it really anyone anyone that needs you know i'd love to say there is a niche um, but really, anyone can use a copier. I mean, you could someone who's a dog groomer, someone who's a lawyer. Like it really doesn't matter yeah. as long as there's any sort of paper volume. That person can be a buyer today. But what I'll tell you, maybe my niche would might be healthcare because okay. there's a lot of things going on in the healthcare industries with these copiers that a lot of people don't even necessarily realize. And I don't think I've said this at one of our meetings before. But a hot button with these copiers right now is HIPAA guidelines. Mm. So HIPAA guidelines are changing every year it seems i mean i constantly go to a lot of networking events in the healthcare field and it seems like they finalize something and then two months later they're re- revamping it again and changing it so everyone has to relearn all of the rules and guidelines to make sure they're staying compliant right and with the copiers people don't even realize is that all of the information and this is very important for anyone that's listening that's in the healthcare field all and in the law, law firms, laws right. as well um so uh all the information that scan print copy or fax to these machines gets stored on the hard drive right so anyone could come in your cleaning crew can come in and just plug in a usb drive and download everything in seconds right. there was a, yeah, there was a hospital in wow. texas that was recently fined millions like hundreds of millions for a breach in their copier so these things are out there but the great thing about the conica minolta's and the kia Sera is they actually have standard on the units encryption codes that as something comes in gets wiped clean right away so you don't have to worry about those right. things and that's critical in your field and totally. in the healthcare field. Yeah, and then it's huge at the end of a lease too that it has to be totally scrubbed. Because, Absolutely, yeah. you know, well, they want to be tossed in, in a dumpster. Yeah. From from a mortgage standpoint, right, I'm, totally. you know, I'm handling people's tax returns. Yep. Yeah, uh, I don't even know right. what You're kind of the, copiers uh, we have. That's but. right. You got to get them in there. Uh, yeah. Talk to your peeps. Well, call uh, my secretary. I'll set up a conversation <laughs> for you. Yeah. <laughs> so have you noticed, is there a change in business of people trying to go, you know, paper-free and keeping stuff in the cloud? That- uh, I mean, yeah, that kind of just goes with, you know, the future. Everyone's right. trying to get away from paper, but you know as well as I do, especially in your field, you, you can't get away from Entirely. paper completely. Right. As much as you can, like, take a filing cabinet and bring it down to a USB drive or something, mm-hmm. you still need your hard copies. You need your signed uh, copies. Yeah. So it's never going to completely go away right. it's just that we'll start seeing people's volume going down and yeah. that's not necessarily a bad thing because then it's less wear and tear on the machines and they'll last a little bit longer right and it's still a need for high-speed scanners absolutely yeah. everyone like, needs the high-speed scanners right. and now they really are like card shufflers they right. fly through those papers i right. mean even like the smallest unit is like 70 pages a minute wow that's great wow that's a lot sweet all right so back to the uh let's do another uh, mullet flip here um what year were you on American? Yeah, can we YouTube that? Is that on YouTube? <laughs> it's not on YouTube. Um, that when I was fifteen, so let me think. That was fourteen years ago. So two thousand four, two thousand five. It was. Right. Did you make it through the first round? I made it through three rounds. No. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> so <laughs> believe it or not, they try to make it seem like it all happens in I'm, one I'm day. I'm googling it right there. So, so <laughs> just let me see if I can find it. There. They they try to make it seem like it happens all in one day, but it was a matter of like a month. Right. And they make you cut your hair the same way, show oh, up wow. in the same T-shirt. Same oh, pair of really? jeans. So, like, yeah, they want to make it seem like it was all done in one production day. Right. But what? in actuality, I showed up to uh, the IZOD Center. Okay. And there were 14,000 people all sitting in the stands around the basketball court. Right. They had about 14 tables uh, lined up across the court, and mm-hmm. they had two judges at each one. They took four people at a time. Right. They'd say, step up, sing the best part of your song. you got like 15 seconds to, to impress us. Right. Then they'd say, all no's, cut off your wristband, let you through the door. They'd say, yes, no, no, no. And you get a golden ticket, you go on. Right. Then I had to do like three hours of paperwork with my father because I was only 15 <laughs> at the time. Right. And uh, we went out to the car, mind you, uh, 
back up a second. I didn't want to do this. I really didn't want to go. Right. I'm the actor. I, I didn't I didn't like singing at the time. My right. sister was the singer. She said, do you want to go to American Idol with me tomorrow? Right. I said, okay, what time? we got to get up at 4 a.m. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you have fun. Right. Let me know how that goes. And at 4 a.m., she woke me up. Right. So needless to say, I made it. She did not. Uh -huh. She didn't talk to me for like two weeks. Right. We, we went out to the car. She's sitting there pouting all upset that I made it, and she didn't. <laughs> but then we had to go back to Chelsea Piers uh, right. two weeks later, and we had to wait outside for two hours. Then the judges showed up. Right. We went in. We had to wait in this room with a whole bunch of chairs, just like a conference center room, and we're all sitting in rows. Had to wait 13 and a half hours before right. I could sing in front of the judges. Right. Got through that one, no problem, and then uh, had to so come were back. Those, what judges? Were... They were just producers, okay, right. people that you might have seen on some other shows, but not necessarily the big names gotcha. of the three judges that everyone typically thinks of. Right. And then we had to come back two weeks later, wait another two hours outside, another 13 hours inside, mm -hmm. and then they tell us, I was like at the back of the line, they said, um, Simon, Paula, and Randy are a little tired, so we're <laughs> wondering if you can come back tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I came from Sayreville, <laughs> had to pay like $150 for parking, and right. I sat here for 15 hours today. Uh, God. I'm singing. <laughs> I am, even my dad was like, I'm not doing this again. Forget right. it. You tell him you're getting in there and singing. Right. So I went in and I said, listen, I really want to sing The Long and Winding Road. And they said, uh, we can't let you sing that. I was like, what? I, I got a vocal coach and she taught me how to sing that song. Right. I've been practicing it for weeks. What do you mean? They're like, sorry, Michael Jackson owns the copyright for that song. We can't let you sing it on television. I'm right. Like, <laughs> so I'm 15 years old and now I'm standing in front of celebrities. I was like, what do I do? Right. I just sang God Bless America. And I did well, uh -huh. but and all three of them had nothing but nice things to say. I mean, Paula didn't really contribute. She was kind of like, you're so cute. Right. <laughs> but um, Randy told me I did my thing, dog. And then, uh, <laughs> then Simon uh, said, listen, how old are you? And I said, I'm 15. He's like, 15. I can tell you, you look really young. But he right. said, you know, you do have a lot of natural talent. So, oh, okay, right. where's the insult coming? <laughs> and he was like, and there's people in this competition that are 28 years old that have fully developed vocal cords. And I can kind of tell that you're in that interim where your voice is kind of struggling as to where it wants to go. Right. So you're he like, said... Uh, the Peter Brady stage. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> he, he very nicely just said to me, like, I think you will stand a better chance in this competition in a couple of years once your voice develops. Continue with that vocal trainer and really see where you could go with this. I just don't... I see this being a letdown experience for you if we let you go through because you're not going to be able to compete with these people that have been doing this as a profession. Right. So he encouraged me to come back in a few years. And you wow. never did. I did. Oh, you did? Yeah, I went oh, back cool. uh, last year. And I oh, made, no, made I... it through the first round, and then uh, it was down in Florida. Nice. And I, I didn't get through the second round. They oh, were really? looking for a sob story this year. Uh... They gave you a big packet. And if you didn't say, like, my twin died in the womb, right. <laughs> you weren't getting on television. <laughs> the, those shows are painful now. I, I like really um, uh, America's Got Talent. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, I've watched it a couple times, but they, everyone's got a story. Right. And I'm not knocking their stories. I'm just clearly the producers are focused on getting people emotionally attached rather than looking for the best artist. Right. And it works. Exactly. It's hardly you know? a competition. It's more of a popularity contest. Yeah. Right. yeah. Who's going to get tweeted the most? So you know? did you make it on TV? They did that show year. a brief clip of me uh, speaking to Seacrest. Nice. So believe it or not, all four of them are short as hell. Really? Like, and the whole point was when I was like 15, I was really tiny. I was like four foot six, four foot seven, something right. like that. So Seacrest is standing next to me and he says, standing next to you on stage is going to make me look like a giant. <laughs> <laughs> He's really only like five, six, right. five, yeah. seven. I think Randy's like five, seven. Paula's like four foot Five. Right. She is teeny tiny, and I think Simon's maybe five eight, five right. seven. Yeah. yeah, that's wild, man. So um, that's too funny. That's great. <laughs> so what a lot of fun. So you went back this year. Uh, do you think about going on any other shows? It's tough because now I'm past that cusp. I'm at 28. I'm going to be 29 next month, so most of them cut you off at 28. Uh, I mean, America's Got Talent. I'm sure there's no age limit or something, but that's right. more of a talent competition than just a singing competition. Yeah. What so about, like the voice. I've thought about it. You know, it's it's very difficult because I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. And that's also why I stopped acting. Right. Because I needed to get a job. I needed to go out and support myself. So when I acted, even if I didn't get the lead role, even if you're the butler that's just standing there, you need to be at every rehearsal. Right. right? You need to be there for the other actors to know how they have to operate around you. Sure. And you got to be dedicated. So coming off of like a break, 
having not known the director or any of the other actors, I can't anticipate getting a lead the first show I go out for or something like that. Right. And knowing that these other people have the time, they have the dedication, it's very difficult for me to compete with them. So mm. until I can free myself up to really focus on something like acting or singing and taking it a little more serious than just hobby or karaoke, right. there's almost no point. I, I would really let myself down, I'm sure. Yeah. And you never know. I mean, maybe Orange Man is the role you were born to play. I should have worn that to American <laughs> Idol. They would have went left right know, through. Man. That'd be huge. Stupid. That's Living cool. you learn, right? That's, That's right. so fun. <laughs> Reminds me of Always Sunny. So, <laughs> so, um, <it's>, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Give me a little lowdown on the local bowling scene. I mean, you had said like some wacky stuff goes down in bowling alleys. Like, what, what's some of the weirdest stuff you've seen? And like, what are you doing out there on a regular basis? Oh, geez. I mean, unfortunately, you see the cops a lot at bowling alleys. Yeah. I mean, you really? Yeah, when you put know that. when there's alcohol and money involved getting thrown around, <laughs> like a lot of people are uh, very get frustrated when they don't like do what they need to do, or they throw a shot, and like when they have five thousand dollars on the line, they throw a split. Like, uh, so there's a lot of tension, a lot of emotion getting thrown around especially just depending on what type of like money actions going on in the bowling alley but I mean I've seen a guy stabbed with scissors I've seen are you serious? yeah I've seen um, Jeez. I I've seen all out brawls I've seen like guys try to start fights with kids <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it, it really it never ceases to amaze you like what kind of whack jobs will show up but uh it's really just a matter of blocking yourself out to all of that because it's very easy to let your emotions get the best of you, especially when you do have money on the line. Right. And I've been doing this a long time, and one of the things that my father had always taught me was try to keep a level head. Mm. And any time I did something irrational, like let's just say I blurted out a curse or something if I missed a spare, right. he would pull me back and be like, listen, I don't think you understand. This is my house. Like I'm well respected around here. People like me. Right. You're my son. So you are a direct reflection of my parenting. Right. So if you're going to do that, I'm not bringing you around anymore. It's embarrassing. Right. Yeah. So it, it it was like shell shocking to me that I could see how serious he was that this was his like playground. This right. is where he's been coming for 45 years. Right. Everyone knows him. So it, I didn't want to slap him in the face by being disrespectful. So in a sense, it's made me calm down mm. and realize I can't overreact like some of these juvenile pricks that are running around. Like <laughs> it, it just makes no sense. It makes yeah. me want to shake my head, but I love him. Right. Because then I bowl against those guys, and I'm like, man, that was a great shot. You really got wrapped. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so you you ball for money? Yeah. Yeah. Now, is yeah. most of the money flowing around? Is it just between like people show up and like action between different players, or are there like prize purses out there? It's, that kind of stuff. I mean, everything you can possibly imagine. Right. Like, imagine as if you were going to go to like the sports betting place at the at Meadowlands or and just throw down on like if the pitcher's going to go five innings, if right. the, if this guy's going to hit a home run, if right. this team's going to win, if the score is going to be five to three. <laughs> right. I mean, there's guys that are betting in the back on like me bowling against you. Really? They're saying like, I think Brian's going to throw a nine on this one. I'll bet five bucks on it. So right. there's that sort of stuff. But wow. then there's also like me against you. Right. There's the actual money that's like going on in the league. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, we're bowling against another team and whoever wins on the standings gets paid out at the end. Right. But there's so many other just, uh, you could go in there and spend $400 if you really wanted that's to wild. a night. Right. So, but just no try idea. to keep it that's in crazy. all in moderation. Yeah. Yeah. And then is, are all of the leagues like money leagues? No, no, no. I mean, the, because as you can imagine, the guys that are actually doing this for sport, the guys mm -hmm. that are having 200 plus averages, yeah, we want to compete. We actually want to have some skin in the game to make it inter interesting. Right. But there's plenty of people that just, you know, go out for a night out with the guys, have yeah. a few beers, or they're in a league with their wife or something. There's right. vacation leagues where the winners get a vacation uh, yeah. or a free bowling ball or something. Uh, so cool. there's plenty of other things to kind of keep it family friendly right. <laughs> during, <laughs> like, you know, the day hours. Right. So what are, where where do you uh, frequent? What you I spot? go all over the state. I, I really do. I don't think there's a bowling alley like within maybe an hour and a half, two hours that I haven't been to. Right. Um, do a lot of tournaments, competitions like New York, Delaware, like you know this whole area about that far. But I uh, frequent the one on Route One, uh, Bolero, okay. and uh, down in Lakewood, I go to Ocean Lanes tonight actually. All right, cool. What's your average? Give or take like two twenty. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it so varies from house to house. And how much money can you make out there in leagues and stuff? 
it, it really does depend. I mean, just like anything else, when you have a hot streak, you got to, like, be in there. You got to be in it to win it. Right. So, I mean, I've had years that I probably broke even or maybe even lost a few bucks, and then I've had years I won, like, 10 grand. Right. So, I mean, it, nice. it, it has been, like, a second income. And even mm -hmm. when I was between jobs for a few months, I was able to do that solely and be able to pay my rent and, you know, uh, support myself. That's so, pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's great that I enjoy doing it, and there actually can be some money if I'm smart about it. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. I like that side hustle. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, we should talk about that. I think there's a movie in this. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'm picturing like a rounders of the bowling leagues. Yeah, yeah. dressed as Orange Man. Uh, that'd be sweet, dressed yeah. as Orange Man. Totally. <laughs> that would be killer. All right, awesome. So, Brian, thanks for coming in. Um, once again, if you are, you know, a local business owner or you know someone that needs a, a printer, copier, scanner, check out Ace OFS, which is Ace Office Solutions, right? Uh, AceOFS.com. Um, you can email Brian at behentz, B H E N T Z, at AceOFS.com. And most importantly, get on Instagram and follow NYM underscore Orange Man. <laughs> yes, um, be sure. So you're going to hit the spring training this year? We'll see. I, not too much to look forward to, but this new GM, hopefully he's got something up his sleeve that'll entice us or at least build that hope back up so yeah. he can knock us back down. <laughs> I mean, uh, you at least got a little excitement with his presence now, I feel like. you know. You oh, know, yeah, whether... so much excitement considering we know <laughs> <laughs> know everything that's happened in the past. Right. See, I, I don't let myself get too excited anymore. Right. I, I go into every season with the same mindset like, all right, let's just try to enjoy it for what it's worth. Same amount of pessimism? <laughs> exactly. Uh, you're not a Jets fan as well, are you? No, thank God. All right, cool. But it's so, not I mean, much better being a Giants fan nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. I'm a Devils fan, so you're you're talking to my heart right now. Right. <laughs> All right, cool. Brian, thanks for coming in. Once again, I'm Evan Balmer. You can find me on Instagram at Evan Balmer. My, I'm Mike Mercia. You can find me at MortgageGuy underscore Mike. And you can find The Mullet Cast on Facebook at The Mullet Cast. Sweet. Thank you. Thanks, thanks guys. Man. Really appreciate it. Oh, wrong button. <laughs> so yeah, it's, a, it's appropriate for. Uh, That's right, it's a little office. There you go.